Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, today we're going to be exploring what's going on in the precious metal markets. Now, the normal rules don't seem to be uh, applying and we're going to try and find out why. Today we're joined by Charles Funk, CEO of Heliostar Metals on the TSX, uh, v with the projects in Alaska and Mexico. We've got Adam Siglenski, uh, Goldline Resources uh, CEO and the projects in Sweden and Finland and Mark Child, Chairman and CEO of Condor Gold with his project in Nicaragua. Hello, Gentlemen, I hope you're all well. Yes, I'm good. Out for you. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, I kind of gave it the clear way at, at the beginning. Um, you know, these are sort of quite turbulent times uh, geopolitically. Um, we are seeing uh, an equities market disconnected with gold price. Um, lots of M and A going on. Lots of quite interesting, sort of funky um, financing structures in place. And I'm sort of intrigued from the sort of sub hundred million dollar. Um, side of things where, where, where you guys sit currently, how you interpret what's going on and maybe how you play it. And, you know, Charles, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you. So what's going on out there? Uh, it's quite unusual. It's unusual for, for junior gold explorers to have the majority of them close to their lows than the highs in the last 52 weeks, but to not be able to get drill rigs, to not be able to get good geos. So... We're in an unusual disconnect that can't continue. We're just waiting for the resolution one way or the other, but um, it's unsustainable what's happening out there. For sure, but, but is, is, it, is it just a case of you know, supply chain issues from last year or is there more to, what, 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 what's your thoughts, Adam? I think you're seeing an increase in demand from the larger companies that are well-funded and, and you know doing quite well in, the, in a market where price of gold is almost 2,000 an ounce. And that puts a little bit more pressure on, on uh, getting access to rigs and stuff for the smaller companies. Uh, and in general, we've got a weak market for the equities um, that just is, you know, you would never imagine going back 10 years that we'd be at $2,000 gold and be at the absolute bottom of the junior market. So um, I think it's, you know, something that we just have to wait through and just kind of keep grinding through. So you're saying what well, prices up because the, the big boys can afford to outbid you, um, and perhaps the, the the drill crews aren't as loyal as they they uh, once were. Mark, are you experiencing things down in uh, Nicaragua? Uh, well, just on the broader market, we um, it's not just the juniors. If I could point out, in February, the biggest gold company in the world, Newmont, hit a 52 week low. So there's a, there's an issue with the whole sector with gold. At that time, around uh, 1850, 1900, yes, it popped up to 2060. But just ahead of that $150 run in you know, Q1 of this year, we had many of the top gold producers in the world uh, at 52 weeks low. So typically, when people, investors are coming into the sector, they'll go into the producers first. They're less risky. They've got lots of cash flow. Um, and they're paying off their debt, and their balance sheet's never been better shape. And then they'll move down to the mid-tier, and then finally, they'll move down to the to the juniors and more risky end of the spectrum, which is which is uh, us, if you like, pre-development. So I, th I think it's more of a sector issue on gold producers. Uh, anything that's listed linked with gold um, has a bit of a disconnect to the gold price right now. And I mean, what do you think ETFs are doing to the marketplace? Because, because like I say, I've, we've seen some M&A activity um, happening. We'll talk about that in a second. We've also um, seen companies, you know, development companies trying to get who haven't had the benefit of the of the cash flowing from from the, these high gold prices. You need know, to sort of unusual structured uh, financings. But the the guys like you are needed. You're, you're the sort of you're the next you know generation of of, of gold that these big companies will need. But Retail, where you get your money from traditionally, are moving into ETFs. They're moving into um, you know physical gold. They're looking at Bitcoin. They're looking at lots of things, but not looking at you guys as, as much as they did. Are they, Charles? No, I think um, I've seen some good studies, um, particularly by the likes of Joe Mazumba, talking about how much money has gone into passive investment other than active investment. And one of the unintended consequences of that is fund managers aren't taking picks on management teams, on projects. And statistically, most of those fail because you're at the early stage expiration. But that's the R&D that brings the new discoveries that ironically brings the big wins that gets the excitement in the sector. So as there's less discretionary cash for, for pure expiration plays, the long term is that the gold price keeps moving up. But yeah, it does, it does lead a big gap in in the replacement of all reserves over the next five or 10 years. 
I mean, Adam, you've just raised some money. I mean, was that was that easy? Was it where did it come from? Where you thought it would? Uh, I, I think you know you're you're always leading with the drill results, and if you've got the right results, then then yeah, this was one of the more easier financings I've done in the past. Um, you know, we pulled a, a really good hole in Sweden. Sprott stepped up and and wanted fifteen percent of the company. So, I think you know in, in the kind of market we're in right now, you're really you know picking your spots to find the best uh, junior companies, and and when the when the price of gold goes up, and when we see that cycle rotation into the sector. I think gold right now has maybe half a percent of global money uh, in the sector. And traditionally, I think it's more like one and a half percent. So when we see that money flow in, and again, there's a lot of cash on the sidelines. As soon as there's a little bit of direction, that money will come in very aggressively and that money will come into the right jurisdictions with the right teams and and ultimately the best projects and the best uh, potential discoveries in the right areas are going to get that money. So uh, again, that's really what drives value. The drill results drive value and uh, access to capital will improve uh, you know, as soon as that money flows in. But right now, uh, it can be challenging to raise money in, in this space. Well, do you, do you think that um, with majors sort of dropping their standards, as it were, dropping you know the, the thresholds which they, they once held to to be able to um, with regards to their M and A, that the developers are going to have to work a little bit less hard uh, or less less hard than they used to um, to actually be bought at? It, it's, it's an interesting concept. Someone someone you know threw that at me the other day, and I was like, well, I don't know. What do you think, Mark? Uh, I think generally that should be true in any market cycle, um, and it's no, uh, and, and I think it'll happen again this time. Uh, so far, the mid tier and the the bigger guys have um, have focused on consolidation of equals almost, as opposed to going down the chain. So they wanted to cut out the the the, the management team, save on GNA, and get to a, a, a much bigger critical mass. And you've seen that with the Ignico, Eagle, Kirkland Lake, which closed at the end of last year. Um, and, and that's happening a little bit through. So I think I think there's a, definitely a move to to bulk up. We're not seeing much through at the junior at the junior level though. Although you know, in February at the BMO conference, which I was at, uh, you had a, a gold development company in Sudan uh, being taken over, and that's sort of war torn by an Australian company. So there you are. It was fully permitted. It had a few. It's got a few million ounces. And that's probably the most one of the most recent examples of uh, an acquisition of a, a construction ready, shovel ready, permitted uh, uh, gold mine. So yes, it's there. It's starting to happen. And what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to get, I'm trying to work out how money sort of trickles down. You know, you talk about trickle down economies, but in in the mining space, yeah, if you're producing gold, there's there's money like never never before. Um, and with M and A activity, you know, the d- developers can be the beneficiaries of phase. But when it comes to the you know genius phase, exploration phase, where you got you guys all exist, things are getting more expensive. In, you know, the inflation is here. Uh, access to you know drill crews, drill drill beds. Uh, machine through supply chains, so everything's getting. It's much harder to be a junior these days. It, it, it feels like. I mean, um, I mean, Charles, I mean, you, you're you know you've been around the block a bit, uh, but you started up with um, Helio Star. What are the kind of cash constraint issues that you have to deal with? Oh, well, actually, I think to go back to the first part of that point, in that today's got two thousand dollar gold price isn't twenty twenty's two thousand dollar gold price, and that's what I think is the catalyst for change. We were. We were talking to some majors last week and they were talking about the way their cyanide costs are going up. We all know how fuel costs are going up and we're all starved for, for, for cheap, good staff at the moment. So those are the three key things that drive inflation in our industry. And so what I think is going to tip the bucket in terms of how that capital flow is going to come down is they're not the cash cows now, the major gold producing companies, that they were six and 12 months ago. So then all of a sudden, they're not just going to be able to dip into their 2008, 2009 reserves. They're going to have to go and look. And I actually think there might be a hollowing out of our sector. The big guys aren't compromising on what they're looking for. In fact, they're getting more rigid. They're saying we only want three, four, five, six million ounce deposits. And so I think there's going to be an influx of these dynamic mid-tier companies that are aggressive and grow. And I suspect they're ultimately they're going to do the deals with with the developers. They're going to take over the the fifty to one hundred thousand ounce a year producing assets. We all know resource bases growing good projects. So I actually think there might be a secular rotation as they get bigger. 
And then either the big, biggest guys either take them out or die. Do you agree, Adam? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And I think you're going to see uh, capital to, you know, continue to go to good management teams in that mid-tier sector. And, uh, and ultimately, there's going to be a lot of really good opportunities for, for these mid-tiers to, to bulk up. And you know, we've, seen, we've seen these gold markets. They, don't, you know, they show up, but ultimately, we're, we're in a, uh, a, a, a sector here that has four, five, six years of exciting growth ahead of it. I think everything cost-wise is going up around the world. And uh, you know, juniors just need to focus on building out resources in, in tier one jurisdictions or uh, in, in good jurisdictions that will attract that, t- that type of investment and aggregation. Uh, in Sweden, you know, we're on a hundred kilometer uh, belt that's controlled really by three different companies. So, you know, I've had many conversations over the last year asking, "Hey, how do we make all these things come together? How do you how do you consolidate a district?" And then you're going to see the creation of these, uh, you know, advanced projects where you can say, "Listen, we've got you know 100 kilometers of exploration potential along this belt. We've got a core asset that we can develop, and then you start putting together a more dynamic and exciting story that uh, has the potential to build into a you know multi billion dollar success." What about you, Mark? Thoughts? I totally agree with what. Charles, Charles's point that it's going to be the, the the smaller entrepreneurial team. Some of these guys will leave some of the bigger producers or have already led them. They've got the experience and they'll do the consolidation uh, within the sector. So it'll be you know, half million ounce companies going up to million ounces or 200 going up to million ounces in, in due course. And I think that that's the way you'll see the M&A happening. Um, is there the money to back that? Yes, I think, I think there is, uh, definitely. Uh, there's a lot of private equity funds out, the royalty funds and companies financing things. We've seen things like Sabina Gold and Silver, uh, people are attending to get the project finance uh, in place. Uh, that There is different types of money. It's not bank debt money typically now. It's uh, private equity debt, uh, or just general private equity funds, and, and a lot of streaming money is very competitive within the sector. So I think the money there is to finance it as well. So you, you make it you make it sound um you know quite simple and, and and it should kind of work itself out. But you know, if we go, go back to 2020, there were lots of new entrants into the marketplace. I still feel this sense that there's lots of new entrants in the marketplace now. But 2020, money was being thrown at um junior uh precious metal companies like it was going out of fashion. And people got very excited. Pr- you know, high prices achieved. Um, but it, they've they've quite a few of those have come off. You've got some very embittered uh, retail shareholders sitting on stock at you know four times, uh, sorry, at a quarter of what what they bought at. Um, is the market going to? You talk about the, the you know players having to sort of almost clean up the market themselves, identify the projects which are going to work, and and you know present that um, to the market in, in a different way. But is that is that is that reality? Are we just going to see twenty twenty all over again? A, I think there's a no. I think there's a, 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 a something else at play here, which is why. Even the majors were at 52-week lows two months ago. And the juniors, some of them are, as you say, down 75% from the highs. And, and that's because the exploration sector is, is traditionally, for the last 50 years, is a risk-on sector. That's where people went to you know, have a, have a punt and hopefully they make 10, 10 baggers on some great new discovery in Finland or where Africa or Nicaragua or wherever it might be. And I think the risk on money has definitely gone into the crypto sector. Yes, that might that's come off uh, in the last three months, but you know the, the retail investor has got burnt in the junior exploration sector and some of the gold producing sector, uh, and it, they're, they're they're not necessarily dying the wool gold bugs. They're there to make money, and we should never forget that we're always competing for capital as as exploration companies and. Definitely, some of that has uh, money has uh, firepower has been, and some of our prices, our share price, are really acting as if gold's fourteen hundred dollars an ounce, not two thousand dollars an ounce. You you could argue um, because the sector as a whole has got a got a identity problem. I think within some of the uh, gold juniors and exploration companies, and that's where I think Adam's comment, sorry Matt, is is right about management. You can't build these companies. We can't build a, an exploration business waiting for that generalist inflow when it comes in every five or six years. We have to be best in breed. And as, as unpopular it is as a statement, is we have to fight for a broad slice of the pie of the people who do regularly invest in this space. We have to have the best projects with the best drill results and the best teams, exactly as Adam said. And then we get funded, and that's what's happened for, for, for the better companies that I'd like to think Helios now is one of. 
But and then when when that tidal wave comes in, that's great. That's when we can all really get an uplift and a. Re- but we have to. This business model has to be sustainable within our investment circle, and then we just surf the waves when they come. If your business model's around generalist capital, it's going to be a difficult, difficult approach. Yeah, I mean, I always like to draw parallels between you know um, smart funding and smart investing. So the, the, you know, when you guys go and tell your story to. Um, the institutions or um, to, to the brokers to try and re- raise the capital. You've got to hone in on, on, on the right things if you want the right type of money, right? And, and getting the right type of money is really important for you, if you guys would, or should be. And likewise, for retail investors looking in here, we've got to focus on the right things in terms of whether it be fundamental investing or making being the right side of, of, of a, you know, of, of sentiment. So, what what should retail investors be looking at? What are the things that you talk to institutions about and say, look, this is what's good about us versus the next guy? I mean, maybe, maybe I don't know, Adam, if you want to pick that up. Yeah, um, you know, a lot, a lot of good points there. I think, you know, you ultimately want the best type of investors that understand the risk, understand that it takes time. Uh, permitting and drilling and, and seasonality and all these things are are real elements. But, you know, you talk to the average retail investor and, you know, they've got a time horizon of 30 days or 60 days. They're, they're, used, to, they're used to throwing bets in crypto and cannabis and mushrooms and, and whatever it is. And making money, and and I've seen I've seen it in multiple cycles, and I'm, I deal with it every day. I much prefer to have an investor that uh, understands that this is a is a, is a uh, uh, expensive business. It's a risky business. It takes time, but if you're focused and you're committed to your projects, and you've attracted the right kind of people and in your the right jurisdictions, you will get supported. You will get funded. Uh, but getting your share price up is a different thing. You need retail excitement too, and you need to. You need to attract those investors, and I think with with inflation today, you've got you know price of gold rising, you've got interest rates rising, you've got U.S. dollar rising. These are this is a very unique time in our industry that these things are all happening at the same time. We're all seeing inflation, whether it's in our businesses or whether it's at the grocery store, um, and there's a lot of confusion out there. And I think the crypto trade has taken um, you know taken some of the limelight and excitement uh, from the gold story, but ultimately. You know, here we're in an inflationary environment. Uh, gold discussions are front and center everywhere, and uh, and ultimately, I think you're going to start to see the retail investors start to ask the question, you know, how do I get outside of just the ETF investment? How do I start picking my opportunities? And again, they are still going to look at jurisdiction. They're going to look at uh, project size. They're going to look at access to capital. And ultimately, I'm I'm you know hoping that we can obviously get a lot of this. The retail money back into our space, and I've, I've lived through some really exciting markets, um, and we are, we're definitely not in that kind of a market right now. I mean, and there's also a new new investor, this Gen Z audience coming. We've we've noticed them coming over from the tech space where they they got money. They're looking at this this whole um, mining sector and saying, "Well, this is the next big thing, apparently." But I don't understand what you're saying. I don't understand the vocabulary. I don't know who's telling me the truth. I don't know what I need to be looking at. Um, maybe it's too confusing. Maybe I do need to go somewhere else. So, you I mean, what, what's your message to them, Mark? I mean, because you, you've been through where these guys are at, you know, it's their early stage, trying to get yeah. people interested. It takes a while, but once people get it, they get it, right? So what do, what do they need to know? What, what does Gen Z need to know? What does retail investing more broadly need to know? What's important? Well, I think I think that firstly, just for gold, I mean, I, I do think we should just go back to the base metal and people have to have a view on gold over the next 10, 20, 30 years. I would just say that should be part of somebody's portfolio. And if I could just take a step back, put 10% of your wealth into, into gold, but think of it like buying a house over the, and how that's going to perform over the next 20 years. If I said, well, the price of gold probably will double in the next 10 to, 10 to 15 years, and you, would, and you, you viewed it as a long-term investment, like a, like a house, that I, I think that's the way to look at it. And then within that, you can buy some physical, you can buy ETFs, and you can buy producers, and you can buy explorers. So I think there are a, a I think people will. The average retail guy shouldn't necessarily stick everything into a junior company, which may or may not get permitted, for example, even with a with a great thing. So I do think one they need to to get this market really moving. Uh, People need to, I think, be positive on gold over over the long term, and and, and then it'll you know, come down and trickle down into our part of the sector. But but do you think it's it's a reflection of um, society 
today, Mark, so I'm going to come back to you and say, compared to how the messages you, you would have used 10, 20 years ago, compared to some of the kind of click baity, um, investing porn type headlines where you go 10 bagger overnight. Um, it, it's very confusing and distracting and, uh, all the other things that it, it shouldn't be. Well, well even, even, today, the, right? even, even the, even the big gold producers are competing with the ETFs for exposure. If you like, people see coup d'etats happening in uh, four countries in Africa in the last five months from Mali to Burkina Faso to uh, Guinea. And, and, and they don't understand that risk. So you asked about ETFs earlier. The ETF, there has been a movement this year of 7 million uh, ounces have been bought in ETFs and 5 million within the last month. In the month of March, there's 5 million ounces coming. That's a massive inflow. In, in, and, and so that, that, and that's, that's triggered, no doubt, by inflation concerns, the hedge against inflation, which gold is, and also geopolitical concerns with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So, and, and I think that could just be the start of an, a major asset allocation in, into the sect, in, into the gold space, which will come through. But maybe I'm talking a little too much on the macro side, but I think it's important for the retail investor to, 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 to get why gold is so important as part of the portfolio. And I think people have lost that a bit. And I'll just throw another point out there. You can perfectly now buy a crypto-based gold asset. So Tether, which you're probably familiar with and your readers might be like a Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, they've got Tether gold. So you can be anywhere in the world. And I predict that in five, 10 years time, there's a good chance that people won't have to put their money into an ETF and open up an account with a broker, which takes a month and everything else. They can actually go on to, the, as long as got internet access, they can open up an account with a Coinbase or an exchange and then buy Tether gold. And that physical gold's held in Zurich in a vault. So that, that again could shift the demand for gold. So if we're correct on gold and gold, could, well, I'm correct on gold, if you like, and gold could be materially higher, say double the next 10 years or so, that's going to lead to a massive shift of asset allocation to the listed equities, right through from the bigger guys down to the junior exploration. So I think that's going to going to happen. I think it's why, why, why the longer term investors should should be looking at the, the, the chronic value, undervaluations of, of many, many companies within the sector. So, it, Charles, if if you look, at, I think I think you said um, you, you mentioned um, earlier, maybe maybe it was someone else about the fact that um, retail retail investors have got, you know, they've got a, they've got a bit, actually they've got a bit of choice about what's out there. It's not it's not it's not just mining. It's you know they've they've got tech, they've got crypto, they've got you know blockchain. There's there's lots of distractions out there. Do you agree with? Um, with Mark, that gold should be part of Gen Z's um, investment portfolio. You know, do, should they should they instead go to ETFs because uh, that's going to be that's going to be much easier? Or do you, or in the reality, do you guys need to get uh, used to a different way of, of funding going forward? You're going to have to find different ways of getting funded. The liquidity from retail isn't going to be there. Does the world look different going forward? Yeah, I think. Uh Mark's comment raises an interesting point. We, we all pitch gold to, as part of your investment as a defensive asset, but we're at the cutting, we're at the R&D edge of the space. We're at the high risk, very high return space. And so maybe we get lost pitching why you should own gold as a defensive asset against why you should buy gold explorer. And the obligation is on us as the management of, of explorers to be, you know, kids today are as smart as their parents or grandparents. That hasn't changed. The reason we all invest is to make money and we want to make as high multiples as quickly as possible with as low as risk, as, as mixed up as that is. That's what we're all trying to do. So it's beholden on us as, a, as an industry and as a sector to explain that if you made money in tech, particularly if you made money in, in biotech, you can easily make money in the gold exploration space. We've just got to explain the way that the, a discovery drill hole is the same as a breakthrough in a scientific trial, that the permitting is the same as, as the peer analysis in biotech. And if we can give these guys um, something where they've made, there's a sort of a few where they can cross over from a space that they're comfortable and made money, then I think it, it's easy. We should promote and be excited about the most exciting reason to invest in a gold explorer is you can find a gold mine and create huge value. So I think, I think we have to embrace and push the excitement 
of what we do. And we have to bring the new investors along for the ride. And the great thing about investing in gold exploration now is right now our sector's beaten up. So your chance of making money in this sector is very high. When you came in in 2020, when all that generalist money came in, we were topping at a peak. And as you touched on, lost people lost a lot of money somewhere else. So I think we're actually at a really exciting inflection point from that new investment perspective in that the market is undervalued. What we do is really exciting for, you know, for those who have been involved in discovery. It's an incredible ride in value creation. And if, if you come in now, you're being a bit more counter-cyclical. And I think you can ride that gold lift that's Mark talking about with ridiculous talk as an explorer. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna add in on there. I think that's a great point. And um, you know, there are two sides to the gold story, and people really forget that exciting um, exploration potential and that discovery curve. And uh, and again, when the pendulum swings and the money comes into the sector, I mean, I think we're going into an environment that you have to look at valuations, you have to look at the market, you have to look at you know what interest rates are going to do. And at some point, you know, when when the pendulum swings, the gold trade becomes one of the few games in town. And when you experience that as as a as an exploration company or a developer, uh, you know, I've experienced uh, you know working with Keegan Resources. We went and at the top of the market, we raised two hundred and thirty million dollars. Uh, we had five million ounces in West Africa, and you know, sixty days later, the market fell apart, and and you know, we went from an, being a I think it was like a six seven hundred million dollar company to a $150 million company with $250 million in the bank and 5 million ounces. So when the pendulum swings, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be ferocious. And, and what we're missing here, and what we haven't seen in a lot of the other sectors, like specifically, you look at cannabis. Cannabis, you had these, this great wealth created by the retail investor. They could pick a company that they thought was going to have a legalized uh, growing opportunity. And what you didn't see is you didn't see uh, big wins getting recycled into other junior cannabis companies. In our sector, you usually have sophisticated money that's placed bets, they make a win, and they ultimately recycle that money into what they think is the next opportunity. So the retail investor is going to be able to tag into that, understand what stories are hot, and understand where people are moving money. And I think that that communication, the, those platforms, the Reddit, the social media platforms uh, are going to make the gold market incredibly exciting because the knowledge is going to be so much more accessible. And, and you know, Mark, Matt, guys like yourself are, are bringing great companies to, to that story and, and helping retail investors understand what that means. But we are so far from that that uh, excitement, that market where everyone's high fiving each other because every stock you pick is doubled or tripled. Uh, the fi- you know, as we call it, the high five index is incredibly low right now. The stocks are at their lowest points, and here we are, you know, approaching two thousand dollar gold. So let's see quarter after quarter if we see uh, you know the majors continuing to be profitable and making money. Um, that's going to re- that, that has an opportunity for us to re-rate the entire sector, have that the, those larger funds come into the space and create sort of this manic excitement around new discoveries, drilling campaigns. And uh, I think the knowledge and education of the retail investor in this sector will grow incredibly when that market does hit. I think I think that's right, and, and, and to kind of um, paraphrase a Desmond Tutu, you know, he, he has a great quote about you know, don't raise your voice, improve your arguments, right? And you know, I think it's incumbent on you know guys like you, you know, good companies with good people with good track records, you know, basing it on fundamentals, not you know, promotion or pump and dump. But is you also need to recognize that. If the, if the buyer's decision making rationale has changed, you need to change your argument. And I kind of like Charles, Charles's point, um, which was, you know, you've got to give, you can't say it's a gold as a, you know, safe harbor or a defense, defense purchase. It's got to be about making money. And you've got to lay that, you've got to lay that out for them and say, the, the, this is what we look for. This is how we do things. This is the right way. Um, and in the long run, this will, this will inevitably give you a better outcome. So I think, so I think that's what I, you know, I like to see from guys like you when you, when you come and talk to us. And I like to see more often because it'll help us and, um, you know, it, it interpret what you're saying more clearly, but also identify the companies which are perhaps a little bit fake it till you make it. Um, well, we still we do need we do need the asset allocation of cash into the sector. I think we all agree that's just not there right now. It's not there from the institutional money. It's not there from the retail money. 
And I think you do need to see that money coming into the sector. Without cash to buy the shares, it's not it's not going anywhere. Um, so what do people look for? You touched on, Matthew. What, do, what should we look for? And I think, yes, everyone says safe jurisdiction. Um, and you tend to have a bit of a north-south divide in that sense, where you can look at the Scandinavia and uh, the North America, East Canada, West, I think Britain, you mean. and so forth. Yes. Well, South, I'm actually thinking more Africa's more risky, Latin America, Mexico's more risky, and so forth. So that, that when I'm talking north-south, I'm referring geographically like that. But even within, it's important for the retail investor to certainly look at what the project and management team are doing to de-risk the project from a political perspective. Because you can also find that there are half a dozen projects in Canada which will never be gold mines because they'll never get permitted for environmental reasons or indigenous community reasons. So it's not Canada isn't necessarily the be all and end all and everything works. And take Nicaragua, people think Nicaragua, we're operating, is super risky. Well, three weeks ago, I went in to go and see uh, the president of the country, President Ortega. I had a one-on-one meeting with him and the Minister of Energy and Mines, and I thought it would last 30 minutes, and we ended up with 90 minutes. Uh, In Nicaragua's case, gold is the number one export. It's the poorest country uh, per capita GDP in Latin America. They let you own 100%, unlike, say, Tanzania, which the government has 45% of as a free carry. Um, and we can have 100%. We've got fully convertible currency. So we've done an awful lot to de- de-risk the project by buying the land, getting a million, uh, and, and getting up to an FS level. So, so political risk, obviously, is, is crucial to try and get that right as part of a retail investor's uh, investment decision. Uh, and then, obviously, it's down to the size and maybe the all-in sustaining cash costs and payback periods and MPVs and has it got district scale of five, 10 million ounces or whatever that, you know, within that as well, and, and backing management teams. So maybe we need to kind of, kind of wrap up with your, with your kind of final thoughts and advice for retail, retail investors. A lot of topics discussed there, a lot of things that you should understand and uh, ask questions about, about for sure. But when I'm considering investing um, in, into this sector, is, is now the right time? Do I need to be a certain type of investor to consider coming in now? Because, you know, I think some of our best investments personally, where we've seen, you know, long term uh, returns is when the markets have been difficult, um, when they have been a bit low, a little bit under, undervalued because they, they, they eventually come back. But it, it, people are a little bit fearful to, to, to take that step, perhaps, you know. So what, what, what do you think, Charles? We're, you know, you, when should we be investing? What should, what's the moment we should be looking for? I used to think you wanted to be perfectly counter-cyclical. You know, you want to go in when things are completely at the bottom. No one's talking about it because that's when you get the maximum return. But you can spend a long time in the trough and get broken doing that. So it's when you start to see the signs that there's inflow into gold. You know, Mark talked on the major gold producers or at 52-week lows. They're breaking above their bands now. That's going to spill over to the M&A targets. So as you start to see that momentum come down the chain, I think you're going to see, you know, that, that's any prediction you make is going to be wrong. But I think we're more likely to get a tailwind in the next few months um, than we have been at any time in the last couple of years. So I think the timing is good. And I've got a lot of personal investments in the gold space. But to wrap up on your sort of closing comments points, we're our own worst enemy explaining our opportunity to investors. We drop acronyms like Mark just did about FS. If you're not in the sector, you don't know what FS stands for. We all do because we're in there and we know a feasibility study comes after a pre-feasibility study and before a bankable feasibility study. We know that jargon. And so the hardest part for a retail investor, and and if you're looking for gold advice, is it's going to take a long time to get your head around the jargon. You're going to get lied to because it's easy for people to make money by appearing to be exciting and not having the bona fides. So look at track record, you know, look at the guys who have made discoveries, who have made people money and back them. If if that's, I think, the, the biggest lesson you can learn when you start is find people who are successful and hungry and back them. Um, and then when you're having wins, you're going to learn along the way. So I think dip your toe in now and pick good teams and, and, and just grow. I think it is going to be an exciting six or 12 months for, for new gold investors. Adam, you're the entrepreneur here. What do you reckon? Uh, I think I think he makes a great point. Um, you can get killed in the trough if you wait too long. 
the sector has been depleted. I think everyone out there has a basket of 10 stocks they think are worth 10% of what they should have. Uh, but you've got to dip your toe in. You've got to be in the sector before it takes off. That's where, you, you know, all these companies, these 10, 15 cent companies, uh, suddenly will be 50 cent dollar companies and, and the entire sector floats. So the tide will rise here. Um, now is the opportunity to pick the right teams. And I think picking teams that have been successful, uh, picking teams in areas that they can advance their projects is key. Uh, being around uh, project areas that have large producing companies that may want to eventually buy your company uh, or, or you know partner in those companies is really the jurisdiction selections you want to make. And uh, yeah, the time I think is now. The inflation story is here. Price of gold is setting new levels, uh, you know, over the last couple of months. And most importantly, you've gone from seeing 52-week lows to this to this breakout. The royalty and streaming companies are going up. You're seeing the major starting to move. And you've seen companies, um, you know, I was talking to uh, Mandalay Resources in Sweden, you know, it was a year, year and a half ago, they were $50 million in debt. Price of gold has gone up. Production has gone up. They've completely serviced their debt, their cash flowing, and now they're in a very exciting opportunity. So um, the world has changed very quickly. It continues to change. Let's watch what happens in Europe uh, and, and, and do your homework now and be ready to make your decisions and uh, you know, dip your toe in and be ready to layer in when you see the, the, the tide really coming in. Mark, final word from you. I think now you've probably got once in a decade opportunity to get involved in the sector and make some serious money. That's my, my, my core belief. I think you'll see gold... Three to four hundred dollars higher by the end of this year as the hedge against inflation, um, and that's going to be the, one of the key drivers for gold uh, in in an inflationary environment, which is embedded and here to stay. Uh, so I think the asset allocation will come in. Now's the time to uh, do your homework and get in with some pretty beaten up stocks. Choose the management teams. Do choose the jurisdictions, um, and and try and go try and identify projects that are going to be a much 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 bigger and can double or treble in size. 